Even the song is wonderful words of life pushing us towards maturity this morning. Praise God. Our scripture this morning is on your worksheet out of Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 16. And have, please remain standing if able and as we read the word and then we'll pray. Ephesians 4, beginning verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together, and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we thank you especially for a, a body of believers, and specifically the body of believers here at Spokane Baptist, where we can get together and, and build each other up and, and just fit together as a, a body. Lord, this morning, help us to uh, just uh, uh, discern between being mature and immature uh, Christian behavior. I think you'd help us to recognize uh, those things we each individually need to do to mature, but to also help others to mature, all for the goal of being conformed to be like you. Well, Lord, we thank you for your instruction and, and encouragement in doing that uh, this morning. Help us. Uh, to do, to address just those things we ask. Bless our time together. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You may be seated. All right. Well, you know, our, our theme picture here, striving together, you know, and, and going the same direction. And, and uh, you know, in reality, we're probably all at different paces, but it's nice to think it's all going the same way and we're in the same boat. And that part's for sure. We are that. Spiritual growth is a team sport, not a solo act. And I like that. You know, that uh, spiritual growth where you think, well, I've got to grow and I've got to do this. But it, it's really a team effort. And what happens if you get two or more, you get stronger, you know, and the team helps each member uh, do a little better. That's the goal of team sports. You well, through the series of lessons we've been discussing, how we may strive together, like those we read about in the pages of the New Testament. You know, the, the, that early church that had to for survival. Well, uh, we, we might be getting there, folks, I keep saying, and, then, and I just uh, don't doubt it, uh, at least to get through it with joy and peace and, and comfort and friendships. Uh, that we can only do together, yeah. and to do that together. Well, uh, we will see today that one of the areas of the Christian life where we are called to strive together is our individual maturity as believers. You know, you, you, know, you might think, uh, you, know, you know, some churches we see that are decreasing because they're all older. You, see, well, that, you might say that's a mature, bo mature body, but it's really not. It's just an old body. It doesn't necessarily make mature, but... Uh, you know, the, as individuals, we need to mature so that the whole body can act as a mature body. Here in Ephesians 4, we discover not only that God wants us to grow toward maturity, but also that God intends us to use us in each other's lives, yeah, to how we can do that, and how to help each other along this journey of faith and journey of growth that we're all on. Uh, you can discern the difference pretty quickly between a, a little child and a grown man. You know, if we brought Hugo up here, you'd know which one was the kid and which one was the adult, right? Or you see pictures, you know, our mind kind of kicks in who's, who's a child and who's a man. Most cases, you can measure their height, 
You can stand them on a scale, listen to them speak, or test their physical strength. And you'll immediately know which of the two you're dealing with. You know, and so we know, like I say, your brain does that instantaneously, usually. Who's the child, who's not? Well, similar principles apply in the area of Christian maturity, but always not quite so visible. You know, there's different things that we need to learn to look for and learn, learn to strive for, and to, as opposed to just growing. There are differences between mature Christians and those that possess an underdeveloped, even stunted level of growth. And it shows. Now, it doesn't take us too long to figure out who's a little more mature than another. And it's not even against those that are maybe as stunted or, or, well, you don't want to be stunted, but those maybe not as growing as quick or haven't, but maybe they're brand new. So, you know, we give them a lot of grace to keep growing. The goal is to keep growing. That, that applies to the pastor, applies to old guys like me, you know, or Phil. We'll pick on Phil and Doug. It's their birthdays this week. So, you know, we want to mature. The Bible term for maturity is the word perfect. You know, and we saw that in our verses. It doesn't mean without flaw. It doesn't mean you are perfect. I wish it did. That's not what the biblical word is. Uh, you know, we tend to use that word as meaning without flaw nowadays, but it comes from the Greek word uh, teleos, meaning fully developed, complete, full grown, or mature. So a little more thing than with, it doesn't say without flaw, just you're, we're getting fuller grown. This term in one of its forms is found 60 times in the New Testament. And two of those occasions are in the passage that we study today in verses 12 and 13, to be perfected. So as we study the heart of Ephesians 4, let's identify three principles for moving toward maturity. First, there are motivators toward maturity. Motivators. You know, we all uh, kind of like to be motivated to do something, right? So what are these motivators? As Paul lays out the case for the Ephesians' spiritual development, he outlines three very special resources that they've each been given, which means that we've been given. You know, they gave it to the Ephesians, we laid it in, they put it in the Bible for us so we can get those as well, which these should contribute to our spiritual growth. Three, these resources would motivate them forward toward maturity, and that's what we want it to do for us. So letter A, we have been given spiritual grace. Spiritual grace. Ephesians 4, 7, there in your worksheet, <coughs> excuse me, he says, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Oh, uh, you know, each of us are given what we need. So it's, we're given the measure according to Jesus. Question is, do we use it? Yeah. Do, do we apply it to our lives? You know, have, and do we accept it and, and use it as he's given it to us? You know, all that is more of a sign of maturity, learning how to accept it, learning how to use it, and then also how to, to give grace too. That's, that's maybe even more the final step towards maturity. We're able to, to grant grace and give others a little more space than we might physically or naturally want to do to give grace. Well, the spiritual exercise of giving, along with other disciplines of the Christian life, is considered a grace. Uh, there on the worksheet, 2 Corinthians 8, 7. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and in utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. Again, you know, and we'll talk about this again, but he gives us so much and gives us so much grace. All, we, all he asks us to do is give a little of it back out and to give what we've been given and display that. We learn that Christian grace involves God's work within us. And after we receive his initial grace and salvation, Peter described the grace of God as being an integral part of our ongoing growth. On the worksheet, 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen.
Oh, glory, yes, to, to grow in that. And a lot of that is in by growing in knowledge and coming to church and hearing the messages and you get that growth and say, okay, well, maybe I need to try that. Maybe I need to change that. And especially in the area of grace and, and dealing with that. Next, we have letter B. We have been given spiritual gifts. We've been given spiritual gifts. Various spiritual gifts are explained in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. However, here in Ephesians 4, Paul speaks of spiritual leaders, specifically pastors and teachers, as gifts from God given for our growth. But, you know, you don't think about that too often, and, and, uh, but it is. It's just, you know, it's just a gift to be able to listen to Pastor Josh on Sunday, Pastor Frick. Me, I'm not too sure about, but, you know, you're, but, uh, you know it, it's actually, I think, it's more a gift to me to help teach. You know, so I hope it is, you know, but uh, it's just a gift that we get, the people willing to do that yeah. and to stand up and teach the word of God. Godly leaders who invest in our lives through their faithful labor are truly gifts from God. Yeah. You know, maybe we wouldn't be so quick to criticize if we realized that a little more sometime. You know, what God gives us, we don't want to criticize, right? Yeah. So think about that next time. Uh, you know, the pastor uh, makes you mad, going, okay, well, you know, he's a gift. I better just thank him, thank God for it anyway. He's probably trying to correct something is why we're mad at him. Right. That's my case, you know. I get mad at him when he corrects me. You know, I've learned to get over it pretty quick. But maturing, <laughs> slowly but surely. Anyway, Paul explained the investment of one spiritual leader, a friend of his, Epaphras. Uh, the lives and the believers of uh, Colossae notice that one of Epaphras' goals was that the members of the Colossian church would stand perfect or mature. It's there on your worksheet, Colossians 4, 12, and 13. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. In other words, he calls out a Epaphras for praying and caring for his fellow believers at the church of Colossae. You know, what a wonderful thing to Example of striving together, he, he, striving in prayer for those people to, to mature and to get more like Christ, to become perfected. Well, uh, I know that this is what your pastors all want. I really do. To, to, have, to see the growth, to see people mature in the word. You know, that's really on uh, their desire of their hearts is to see us all grow and to, and to keep growing. Again, we're going to do it at different paces, uh, you know, different levels, but we can all keep growing, and it's just so wonderful uh, to see people continuing to do so. So uh, we want to return. The best return for a gift is doing what you're given, and, and maturing is great. Well, and towards that, letter C, we've been given a spiritual goal. We've been given a spiritual goal. As the saints are perfected or made mature, the results, according to verse 12, are that the work of the ministry is accomplished and that the body of Christ is edified or built up. So we can see what's happening. And I praise God, we see that, I think, in our church growth. We see it growing just because people are getting mature. And, you know, it's a good sign as a body we're doing what we're supposed to do. And again, that's striving together. One person isn't going to make any of that happen by themselves, at least very difficultly to do. Much easier when you got a whole team rowing in the same direction and pulling together. God has a job for this church, which is to fulfill his purposes and carry out the Great Commission, winning people to Christ and discipling them in the faith. Two things you hear about a lot here, you know, the, the, the outreach and the winning the lost and then discipling and teaching them, growing them in the Lord Jesus. But the fulfillment of these goals hinges on the maturing of the saints. Again, we couldn't do it alone. Even the four pastors just couldn't do it by themselves. And we so appreciate your help and the effort. And like BBS, what, 70-some, 80 volunteers? My goodness. 
praise God. You know, that's, that's what we're looking for. That's what God is looking for. They're on the worksheet, 1 Peter 4.10. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Oh, you know, in the, in the story of the steward, you know, they looks for the, the statement, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, and that's such a blessing to, to share the wealth, if you will. You know, all that we've been given, share it out and bring others along and give it to others. Grant them that. So, number two, what is the measure of maturity? The measure of maturity. If we want to measure our progress, what yardstick? should we use? Another Christian? A guy down the street? Of course not. We don't look at any of that necessarily. The problem with comparing ourselves with those around us, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 12, is that we either find someone doing far better than us, which defeats us or makes us feel bad, or we find someone doing far worse than us, which lifts us up in pride. So neither one of those is good. To, when you start comparing. Now, instead, verse 13 provides two criteria for measuring spiritual maturity. You know, I, I used to joke quite a bit with Kathy. You know, we'd, say, I, you know, we'd see somebody doing something bad, and I, I'd kind of poke, you could be married to that guy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and I used to, you know, kind of be kind of propped up with that, right? Or, you know, and usually it was in joking, but maybe not all the time, you, you know. <laughs> you could have done worse, in other words, you know. Well, then this verse uh, that I'm going to read kind of actually changed my heart. Instead, you want to be the husband that Kathy deserves, you know. Not, not better than whoever you're, you know. Because what if we did find somebody better, you know, then I'm in trouble, right? <laughs> so it's just better... Uh, to let your heart just be mature. Second Corinthians ten twelve there on your worksheet. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. So I gained some wisdom when I quit doing that, in other words. You know, another step towards maturity. Just doesn't do any good. To compare yourself to somebody, whether it's better, worse, whatever. It's all about either feeling, feeling better or feeling worse. And we got enough stuff going on to worry about comparing. Right. You know, our, our responsibility to God is do it at our pace and the steps we want to do. So, uh, uh, so uh, letter A was look at there should be unity with the saints. There should be unity. You know, we can all help each other towards that and be unified. Verse 13 begins with this goal, till we all come in the unity of faith. God wants us to function with unity. Yeah, he wants that. Carnal, immature Christians tend to create friction through complaints, gossip, bitterness, and being difficult to get along with. But spiritual growing Christians are able to infuse the grace of God into the relationships in their lives, creating unity. And as I meditated on that, you know, we all know those people that complain and are bitter and, you know, nothing ever seems quite right. They kind of tend to stand out. You know, we can recognize those. But the second one, the, the mature growing Christians, you know, they might sneak by us. We don't necessarily notice that. You know, there might be instances, but they tend to just be quietly going about their business of growing and maturing and, and doing what God calls them to do. And, you know, we, we all appreciate that, even though we maybe don't see it specifically. So I think you understand what I'm saying. You know, it's just being that part of maturity is just doing what God calls us to do. And because it's with God, you're not looking for recognition or or any of that. You're just kind of doing uh, what we should be doing. Praise God. Well, Philippians 1.27 says it this way. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. 
You know, just linking arms, holding hands, going forward for the strength of the gospel. What a blessing that is. Well, next on letter B, there should be conformity to the Savior. That's our measuring stick, conforming to the Savior. Verse 13 continues, till we all come unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Gives it to us right there, the fullness of Christ. That's what our goal is. The measuring tool for spiritual maturity is the person and character of Jesus Christ. And we all know we're never going to get there until we get to heaven and get our heavenly body. But that's kind of the point. That, that shouldn't defeat us. That should keep us striving together and helping each other to get there. We, we can become more like him each and every day. And that's what we want to do. That's our true journey toward maturity. Just another baby step towards him. Maybe once in a while we get to make a giant leap towards being like him. And that always feels good. But we, we, know, we can't pat ourselves on the back and go backwards. You know, we want to keep going forward, step at a time. Romans 8, 29 there says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You know, he knew if we were going to be saved or not. And, and he, knowing those that are saved, he had something for us to do. Some steps to continue on, the road to stay on, the path to, to follow, to get more and more like him. That he, that's what he predestinated was our path yeah. towards him, Good. becoming like him. We are not to be conformed to this world, but we are to be conformed unto the image of Jesus Christ. That's our goal. Romans 12.1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Just reasonable, I like that. Just, we have good reason just to do it, because yeah. what he's done for us. So what mold are you being pressed into this morning? Is the culture of the world pressing you into its mold through media, entertainment, worldly influence it's certainly trying to it's trying hard <laughs> and often too successfully to do just that or are you allowing the word of god the spirit of god the circumstances of your life and even other christians to help conform you into the likeness of jesus christ oh choose oh church i'd say choose the latter you know do the godly things, the godly people to, to conform us. The world's not going to do it. The world doesn't want to do it. That's, that's not a big secret. They want to yank us away as much as they can. But we want you to go. You, know, there's, uh, uh, you don't hear it much anymore. It used to be a phrase, you know, uh, gigo, garbage in, garbage out, the G-I-G-O. And I thought, you know, and that, that's so true. It's almost, I think it's not out there much anymore because that's all there is out there is garbage, <laughs> you know. But I thought I like the, I like Bible. It almost sounds like Bible, but Bible, blessings in, blessings out. Bring in the blessings, give the blessings out. I don't know if that's anywhere. I, I, hopefully I made that up. But if I, you know, if I stole it from somebody, I'm sorry. But, but you know, let's, let's adopt Bible as our theme going forward. Well, then number three, then, we'll see the marks of maturity. The marks of maturity. If we are becoming more like Christ, what characteristics will or we won't have present in our lives? Paul answers this question in the final three verses of today's lesson. First, we need to recognize that there are three telling marks of immaturity. Telling marks of immaturity. Again, these can be maybe a little easier to recognize sometimes. Well, uh, in verse 14, uh, Paul describes what God's will wasn't for the Ephesians converts. Uh, number one, they're unstable in devotion. Unstable in devotion. Immature Christians are easily blown off course, sidetracked, sidetracked from growth, and tripped up in their forward progress. 
You know, whenever we hear of a new salvation, somebody just accepting Christ, we pray especially for him because Satan tries to get him quick. He doesn't want him to put roots down. You know, he's going to try to get them to be unstable and not follow like they should. But this is not God's will. And it's dangerous for the one who is not striving together towards maturity. That's why we encourage new believers to get in a good church, get in the word, you know, get, just surround, immerse yourself, if you will, in the word of God so that you can keep growing and not be drug off so quickly, you know. Families can be some of the worst at doing that. Friends especially, you know, they don't want to lose their drinking buddy, for example, or whatever it is, you know. They, they want to uh, grab you and take you away. So we are warned by James there on your worksheet, James 1.8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. If he can keep you unstable, Satan's going to try to do that very thing. Yet both things kind of going on at once and you go back and forth and, you know, and we just, uh, we need to be on guard against that. And we need to help each other stay on track. Again, new Christians or even a brother who's maybe been a Christian for a while, can all of a sudden something can start pulling them away. We need to be on guard against that for each other. We need to watch out for one another and help, help, help them stay on the path. You know, get them out of the ditch and back on the road, whatever it might be. You know, spinning their wheels in the gravel, whatever. But only we can tell that, you know, and we need to keep that in mind and look out for it. You know, you, you read all the time, the tragedy, and maybe, you know, we've had a scare like this where the kid wanders off, you know, and weren't quite paying enough attention, so the kid wanders off, and then what? Then panic sets in, you know, and you go, oh my goodness, you know, and, and call the authorities or everybody, you know, and comb the fields for this lost kid. It ought to be like that with the people in our family, our church family. Watch out for them. Don't let them wander off. Well, then number two, they can be unsure of doctrine. Unsure of doctrine. There's a reason the Great Commission includes the final instructions of teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. It's in the Bible. Yeah. You know, it's in here. They can be sure of the doctrine. The Lord Jesus knew that new converts must become grounded in the teachings of the word to inoculate them from the false teachers who would wait in the wings to deceive. You know, sometimes we see that. Even a new Christian might be excited, maybe goes to some website and, you know, starts getting them offside a little bit, you know, or, or some uh, other religion shows up at the door and tries to get them moving in a, in a wrong direction. We need to get them indoctrinated into the word of God is what we need to do. Keep that in front of them. Well, because that can lead, number three, unable to discern. To discern. To be able to uh, study to, and be approved of what we're studying. God wants his children to be able to discern between a truth and a lie. Yeah. You know, we want to be able to recognize that lie when somebody tries to tell us that. And we want to recognize the truth. And our spirit will bear witness to that, I think. You know, that, okay, that, you know, that's in the Bible. You know, it's right there. That helps us discern the truth, and between right and wrong. What's right or wrong? Again, you know, tools are given to us, but we need to help each other towards that too. But the one who doesn't grow is unable to discern both good and evil. You know, and again, I'm sorry to say we've seen that. Where you see, why do they keep choosing the bad thing to do? It's because they haven't grown. You know, and, and, and people that get stunted or quit growing will just can make the same mistake, maybe over and over, until something gets their attention. Well, that something could be one of us. You know, say, hey, that's just wrong thinking. You need to get back into the Word. You need to get back in church. Yeah, you, you need to tune in the live stream. Whatever it might be to get them the true Word of God, to help them discern the, between the good and the evil. Hebrews 5.14 there in the worksheet says, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The strong meat of the word, people, gives us that tool to help discern between good and evil. 
instead of being unstable in disposition, unsure of doctrine, and, in, and unable to discern, God's plan is that we would drive deep roots into our relationship with Jesus Christ and with his word. Get those roots growing deep quickly. Get them to hang on. Colossians 2, 6 through 8 there it tells us, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, and after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Uh, people are out there trying to lead us astray and mislead us. And really it comes down, you know, the word of God in, in its essence I think is pretty simple. Yeah. You know, believe on God and confess with your mouth and you're saved. You know, and people can try to complicate that and make it so elaborate that it's hard to follow and that can be discouraging. And on and on and on. We want to preach the simple truth of God's word. And, and it's in here. We should be able to show that it's in here. Not something I've seen in another book or online somewhere. You know, that means nothing to me, frankly. Show me in the Word of God, and we'll, then we have something to talk about. Well, uh, I like this uh, picture. You might recognize this guy. It's not Pastor Josh. Uh, that is Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday is a great preacher in his day. He had the great sermon, Payday Someday. Boy, if you want to hear a good sermon, listen to that one because there will be payday someday. But anyway, that, that's why we don't put a chair here uh, by, the, by the pulpit. I, I'm afraid Josh would try this. Uh, you know, we think he's pretty wild, but Billy Sunday, uh, that guy could preach. Well, when he was converted and joined the church, a Christian man put his arm around the young man's shoulder and said, William, there are three simple rules I can give you to you, and if you will hold to them, you will never write backslider after your name. Take 15 minutes each day to listen to God talking to you. Take 15 minutes each day to talk to God. And take 15 minutes each day to talk to others about God. Well, Billy Sunday was deeply impressed and determined to make these the rules of his life. From that day on throughout his life, he made it a rule to spend the first moments of his day alone with God and his word. Before he read a letter, looked at a paper, or even read a telegram, he went first to the Bible so that the first impression of the day might be what he got directly from God. He put that foundation of the word into his very being, and he became a great preacher. And then letter B, and uh, there's a misprint on your worksheet. I think the worksheet has another A there, but it's actually letter B. There are three triumphant marks of maturity. So those are the immaturity. What are the marks of maturity? In verses 15 and 16, Paul explained what maturity would look like in the Ephesians' lives, and thus in our lives as well. Mature Christians engage in communication that's meaningful. We want to have meaningful communications. Mature Christians are unafraid to speak the truth whether it's to a blatant faith denier or a friend who is strained. But when they speak, they speak in love. Their speech follows Paul's instructions. Yes, we want to uh, communicate, but communicate in love. Yeah, uh, Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. You know, just to be able to speak then. You know, um, we pastors in our meeting, we're just talking about this very item this week, that yelling at somebody never converts them. Yeah. You know, it just whether it's in person or whether it's over Facebook, that's not going to bring a lot of converts, just yelling at them and screaming that they're wrong. You know, what we want to do is love them. Show them that, hey, I disagree, but boy, I love you and sure hope you'll come around. Yeah. We're praying for you. Most of them don't want to hear that but it's true, and then and do it. Well, mature Christians have a Christ-centered mindset, a mindset. Verse 15 speaks of Christ as affecting all things, which is the head. Mature Christians place Jesus Christ at the center of their lives, 
so that everything else revolves around him. He's not just at the top of their list. He's at the center of their lives. Like the hub of a wheel, where the spokes of life connect and extend, Jesus Christ touches and changes every area of their lives. Let him into everything. Your schedule especially, Fausti talks about, show us a calendar, we can show you what's important to you, you know, to do that. Colossians 1.18 says, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He wants to be preeminent in everything. Mature Christians uh, give of their time and their resources. It's a contribution to the members. Verse 16 teaches that we are connected, just like a human body, and that we are interdependent with one another, as 1 Corinthians 12 teaches. We are each to contribute to the health and growth of every other part. 1 Corinthians 12, 21 and 2 there. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Uh, we were just talking this morning to another member about our aches and pains and joints that hurt and areas, you know, and praise God, we got other pieces of the body that can still get us here to church, you know, and, and work together and build each other up. And that's what a body of believers should be doing. So there are five principles for the body in Ephesians 4.16. We'll look at real quick. Uh, the principle of addition, the whole body fitly joined together joint and work together, addition. The principle of variation, that which every joint supplieth. You know, we'd hate it if every one of us was exactly the same. It'd be pretty boring, to be honest, you know? So the variation, that's what gives us life and, and excitement and encouragement. And the, the principle of contribution, working in the measure of every part, contributing towards the well-being of the whole, towards each other. And the principle of expansion, increase of the body. You know, we might still be missing a few parts. Let's bring them in. God knows who they are. God will bring them in to, to fit what we need. So, con expansion. And then there's the principle of devotion. Edifying of itself and love. Just to be devoted to Christ. Love him, love others through him. So this morning we ask, are you growing spiritually? What's standing between you and the maturity God has called you to and that Christ has modeled for you? Why not determine today to lay aside every immature Christian character or immature characteristic that remains in your life and to cultivate the character of Jesus Christ? You know, I know I still have some immature areas. Uh, I, I hate to tell on the pastor, but I've seen a couple of little things he might be a little immature in. But you know what? He's, he's correcting and growing. And I pray I am. We want to keep doing that. What are you doing to help others to grow spiritually? We are to strive together, as our lesson indicates. Strive together in helping our brothers and sisters move toward maturity. Who can you encourage? This week, who can you help along the way of spiritual development? Together, we can be the mature, grounded, and difference-making Christians that Jesus has called us to be. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you this morning, Lord, for just your lesson on maturity and how we each uh, can strive, but also strive together to become more and more like you. That's our goal this morning uh, and our prayer this morning that you would help us to uh, become more discerning and more willing to supply grace and just give each other and give ourselves the benefit of trying to grow in you. Help us along that path, I pray. We pray for the service to come, Lord, that you would just uh, uh, bless the pastor as he brings us your message and just uh, with more questions that you're asking us. Help us to respond appropriately, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' precious, wonderful, and glorious name. Amen. Amen. All right. Next week, uh, we'll look a little closer at this. We're striving together as the body. Getting all these joints moving the same direction together. Praise God.